This is a homily for the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. The Gospel of Mark is a major source for Matthew's Gospel. In fact, Matthew incorporates about 90% of Mark's Gospel, usually in an abridged form. And Matthew retains the basic structure of Mark's Gospel, ministry in Galilee, the journey to Jerusalem, and finally, the last week in Jerusalem. Today's Gospel is set during the Galilean ministry. Jesus has preached, instructed, and healed people in many of the towns around the Sea of Galilee. However, in chapter 11, we become aware of the opposition that Jesus is encountering. And in the verses immediately prior to today's gospel, he denounces the towns that have not responded to his proclamation. To illustrate the lack of response to his ministry, Jesus uses an example from life around him. Imagine two groups of children sitting in the marketplace. One group tries to engage another group of children in a game. Let's pretend we're at a wedding party. We'll play the pipes and you can dance. Let's pretend we're at a funeral. We'll sing dirges and you beat your breasts. With whom can I compare this generation? It is like children shouting to the others as they sit in the marketplace. We played the pipes for you and you wouldn't dance. We sang dirges and you wouldn't beat your breasts. Like children refusing to play, people have responded negatively to the ministry of John the Baptist, but also to the more joyful proclamation of Jesus. For John came, neither eating or drinking, and they say, He is possessed. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus then begins to reproach the towns in which most of his works of power had been done, because they did not repent. Alas for you, Chorazin! And here you can see the ruins of the ancient town of Chorazin. Alas for you, Bethsaida! For if the works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Here are some of the remains of Bethsaida, which according to John's Gospel was the hometown of Philip, Andrew and Peter. Now it's Capernaum's turn. Matthew tells us that Jesus had left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea. He refers to Capernaum as Jesus' home town. But even the town that Jesus had made his own did not respond to his proclamation. And as for you, Capernaum, would you be raised as high as heaven? You shall be flung down to hell. For if the works of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. Only I tell you, that it will be more bearable for Sodom on Judgment Day than for you. Here you can see the ruins of Capernaum looking towards the remains of the ancient synagogue. The response of these three Galilean towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida and Capernaum, foreshadows the rejection by most of Israel of its Messiah. It's interesting to note in passing that although Chorazin was only two and a half miles or just over four kilometres from Capernaum and Bethsaida is just over 11 kilometres from Capernaum, the Gospels tell us nothing about the great things that Jesus did in those two towns. These denunciations immediately precede today's Gospel. Against the backdrop of these denunciations, Jesus says, 
I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and of earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. So who are the wise and intelligent and who are the infants referred to here? In the first instance, the wise and intelligent refers to the scribes and Pharisees who laid claim to superior wisdom based upon knowledge of Scripture and their own tradition. Who are the infants? The Greek word that Matthew uses is nepios, and it does mean infant or child. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, it often carries the literal meaning. But the Septuagint also makes the word a technical term for the righteous. So the denunciation of Chorazin, Bethsaida and Capernaum is not the final word. Jesus' message is rejected, but it also finds acceptance as well among infants, that is, the unpretentious little ones. They are the poor and uneducated, sinners, tax collectors, ordinary folk, who had never been given the opportunity to study the scriptures in depth. These people were discovering more about God simply by following Jesus, by welcoming his teaching, by pondering it in their hearts and practicing it in their lives. The learned specialists thought they already had all the answers, and so their minds were closed. New Testament scholar Brendan Byrne cautions us all. We can hardly leave the statement simply in that distant past. Jesus' words are a timeless challenge to all pretension to theological and religious expertise that does not begin from awareness that, at best, it is only reflection upon what little ones have come to know about God. Theology, if it is to speak of God as Jesus reveals God to be, must stoop down and go through that narrow door. From the Desert Fathers comes the story of Abba Arsenius, He was a learned and cultured man who had abandoned a comfortable lifestyle in the imperial court of Constantinople to live the life of a hermit in the Egyptian desert. Asenius once asked an old Egyptian monk for advice about the spiritual life. Another monk who saw this said, Asenius, how is it that you, who are so learned in Greek and Latin, are asking that uneducated peasant about the spiritual life. He answered, I have a lot of worldly knowledge of Greek and Latin, but I have not yet been able to learn the alphabet of this peasant. The American Trappist monk Thomas Merton, one of the most influential Catholic authors of the 20th century, wrote a great deal about the spiritual life, but he always considered himself a beginner. One cannot begin to face the real difficulties of the life of prayer and meditation unless one is first perfectly content to be a beginner. Let us be convinced of the fact that we will never be anything but beginners all our life. St. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, had this to say, Has not God turned human wisdom to folly? God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. A distinguished man once came to visit a Zen master seeking enlightenment. The visitor began to tell the master about his achievements and successes in life. He spoke at length about the degrees and diplomas he'd been awarded. 
As the visitor continued his never-ending success story, the master placed a cup before him and began filling it with tea. After the cup was filled, the master kept pouring tea into it. The visitor quickly moved away from the overflowing cup, saying, Stop pouring! The cup is full! No more tea will fit in the cup! The master replied, Like this cup, you are overflowing with your own opinions and achievements. How can I teach you anything unless you first empty your cup? We now come to what has been referred to as the thunderbolt from the Johannine heaven. In other words, verse 27 sounds more at home in John's Gospel rather than in the Gospel of St. Matthew. Jesus says, Everything has been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. In considering this verse, New Testament scholar Douglas Hare alerts us to different emphases in the Gospels of Matthew and John. Verse 27 has become known as the thunderbolt from the Johannine heaven. The reciprocal knowledge of the Father and the Son is clearly a theme more characteristic of John than of the Synoptic Gospels. We must distinguish carefully, however, between the divergent appropriations of the saying, whereas for John it speaks of the incarnation of God's eternal word, For Matthew, its language is messianic, referring not to Jesus' essence, but to his function. In other words, Matthew is telling us that Jesus is the only one who can tell us what God is up to. Jesus knows God fully. He understands God's will, and God's will as it is being revealed in the coming of God's kingdom. Let's come back for a moment to that overflowing cup of tea. Not only are the wise and intelligent like an overflowing cup, they have also burdened others with a religion of rules and regulations. Jesus, however, makes a promise. Come to me, all you who labour and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Here again... Matthew evokes the Exodus theme, alluding to Exodus chapter 33, verse 14. Moses is speaking to the Lord, wanting to know the nature of the guidance that God will provide for his people as they journey through the wilderness. Moses says, If indeed I enjoy your favour, please show me your way so that I may understand you and continue to enjoy your favour. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. God replies, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. In Jesus, we have the divine presence giving his people rest. The Greek word for rest is anapausis. How should we understand this word? What? kind of rest does Jesus mean? Brendan Byrne tells us that the Greek word anapausis conjures up the refreshing break the travellers across a desert find in some oasis along the way. In the biblical tradition, God's resting on the seventh day following the work of creation, Genesis chapter 2 verses 2 and 3, and the idea of the Sabbath as a day for rest and union with God, led to descriptions of the Messianic age as a time of rest. The sense is not that of idleness and absence of activity, but of arrival at the fullness of life in the kingdom, the enjoyment of an eternal Sabbath with God. Jesus is presenting himself as the one who can safely lead burdened humanity to rest in this final sense. 
Jesus then says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. I'd like to focus upon four aspects of these words of Jesus. Firstly, Jesus' yoke is not easier or lighter because he demands less, but because he bears more of the load with the burdened. In contrast to religious teachers who sought positions of honour and prestige, Jesus has come not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, as we read later in chapter 20, verse 28. Secondly, the wisdom tradition is an important backdrop to these words of Jesus. In the Hebrew Bible, or Tanakh, the wisdom books are part of the Ketuvim, or writings. In the Old Testament, the wisdom books form a discrete section. Let's consider chapter 51 of the book of Sirach. The book of Sirach, also known as the Wisdom of Jesus, Son of Sirach, or the book of Ecclesiasticus, was written in about 200 BC. It is included in the Septuagint, but it is not included in the Tanakh or Hebrew Bible. The canonicity of the Torah and the Prophets had been firmly established by the 1st century BC, but at the time of Jesus, the contents of the writings were still open-ended. Although there had been some debate, Christians accepted Sirach as part of the canon. However, Judaism did not include it among the Ketuvim or writings when the definitive list of sacred books that constitute the Tanakh was finalised. Today, Jews and Protestants list Sirach among the Apocrypha, but Catholics and Orthodox Christians include it among the deuterocanonical books of the Bible, accepting it as part of the canon of the Old Testament. In chapter 51 of the book of Sirach, we are not hearing the voice of Lady Wisdom herself, but rather the voice of a sage who has sought wisdom and summons others to follow his example. When we consider chapter 51 alongside Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, there are a number of striking similarities. New Testament scholar Richard Hayes makes this observation. There is an overwhelmingly strong case for an intertextual link between Sirach and Matthew. The Matthew passage is not a quotation, but it is, at the very least, a loud echo of Sirach 51. Any interpretation that fails to discern this intertextual connection will surely be a diminished interpretation, deaf to the text's resonance with an important older tradition. So let's consider some of these loud echoes. Firstly, both texts are a direct call to the reader or hearer. In Sirach, come close to me. In Matthew, come to me. The hearers are, in some way, needy or suffering. Lacking and thirsting in Sirach and labouring and burdened in Matthew. Both texts exhort the hearer to take the yoke by receiving instruction or learning. In both texts, the result of taking on this yoke of instruction is that the thirsting or labouring hearers will find rest. So, the key words that both texts have in common are zugon, yoke, and anapauso, giving rest. What conclusions do we draw from this? By evoking the motif of the yoke of instruction and the rest promised to those who accept it, Matthew links Jesus with divine wisdom. But 
Jesus does more than merely point the way to wisdom as a source of rest. Rather, he is the one who can actually give rest to all who come to him. Jesus embodies the functions and attributes of divine wisdom. Thirdly, let's look at these words and you will find rest for your souls. They are a quotation from the prophet Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16. The Lord says this, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Which was the good way? Take it and you will find rest for yourselves. The word in Matthew's Gospel translated here as souls is suke, while the word in Jeremiah translated as yourselves is the Hebrew word nefesh. The Hebrew and Greek words can both be translated into English as soul or person. These words by Jesus and Jeremiah share a similar context. The words of Jesus follow immediately after his complaint that the people have rejected both John the Baptist and himself, and his bitter denunciation of Chorazin, Bethsaida and Capernaum. The words of Jeremiah also follow a fierce denunciation of the people. Reform Jerusalem, or I shall turn my attention away from you and reduce you to a desert, a land without people. And in Jeremiah, how do the people react? The very next line expresses their disastrous rejection of the gracious offer of God. But they said, we will not take it. Richard Hayes again. Jesus' gracious word about rest for your souls in Matthew 11.29 evokes the same ominous overtones found in Jeremiah 6. This is an offer of divine grace, but refusal of the offer leads to disaster. And sadly, people will also reject the gracious invitation of Jesus as well. Fourthly and finally, Jesus says that his yoke is easy. The word that Matthew uses is Christos. I consulted several lexicons and they offered a wide range of meanings, such as serviceable, suitable, good, useful, benign, obliging, agreeable, gentle, pleasant, kind, mild, helpful, comfortable, serving a certain purpose, easy to wear. However, in the context of today's gospel, I'd like to suggest well-fitting or fit for purpose. And for this reason, yokes were made of wood and they were carefully fitted to suit the two animals who were to be yoked together. In other words, the yoke was tailor-made to fit each animal so that it fitted smoothly across the neck. As a carpenter in Nazareth, Jesus would undoubtedly have fashioned many yokes. If we take up the idea that each yoke is fashioned individually for each animal, it says something important by way of analogy about the call to discipleship. The yoke for each of us is different. In the words of St. John Henry Newman, God has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. This, therefore, involves a process of discernment. In the words of Thomas Merton, it is true to say that for me, sanctity consists in being myself, and for you, sanctity consists in being yourself. For me to be a saint means to be myself. Therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is in fact the problem of finding out who I am and of discovering my true self. In other words, I must wear the yoke that has been specially prepared for me, not the yoke prepared 
for someone else. Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, made this comment. At the Day of Judgment, as we are often reminded, the question will not be about why we fail to be someone else. I shall not be asked why I wasn't Martin Luther King or Mother Teresa, but why I wasn't Rowan Williams. Rowan Williams has written about the spirituality of the desert fathers and mothers in a book entitled Silence and Honey Cakes. The significance of the book's title comes from this story. A certain brother came to see Abba Arsenius at Scatus. He arrived at the church and asked if he could go and visit Abba Arsenius. He was encouraged to have a bite to eat before going to see him, but the visiting brother replied, No, I won't eat anything until I have met him. Arsenius's cell was a long way off, so they sent a brother along with him. When they arrived, they knocked on the door, went in, and greeted the old man, then sat down. But nothing was said. The brother who'd been the visitor's guide said, I'll leave you now, pray for me. But the visitor didn't feel at ease with the old man and said, I'm coming with you. So they went off together. The visitor then asked, Will you take me to see Abba Moses, the one who used to be a highwayman? When they arrived, Abba Moses welcomed them happily and enjoyed himself thoroughly with them until they left. The visitor was then asked, Well, I've taken you to see the foreigner, Abba Asinius, and the Egyptian. Which do you like better? Without hesitation, the visitor replied, The Egyptian Moses for me. One of the monks overheard this and prayed to God, saying, Lord, explain this to me. For your sake, one of these men, Arsenius, runs from human company. And for your sake, the other, Moses, receives them with open arms. The monk was given a vision of two boats floating on the river. In one boat sat Abba, Arsenius, and the Holy Spirit of God in complete silence. And in the other boat was Abba Moses with the angels of God. They were all eating honey cakes. The way of discipleship, the Lord's yoke, is different for each of us. For some of us, it is the way of silence. For others, it is celebrating with honey cakes. My yoke is well fitted and my burden light.